Welcome to part two of the chapter one lecture on the introduction to systems analysis and design. So we're halfway through and let's take a look at the information that users need. Now, what's interesting is most people might have the assumption that top management is going to consume the majority of information that we produce from the data, the databases, you know, all of the things we record. However, the truth is the majority of information is consumed at the operational level, i.e., you know, are we productive today? Are sales what we expect them to be today? Are employees meeting expectations with processing time? Um, are they processing customers through fast enough or, or maybe even slow enough? Are they taking time with customers? You know, that gets us up to, you know, supervisors and team leads who, who tend to disseminate that information down to the operational employees. But, you know, departments that need it, definitely even IT, we need information. We need to know how reliable our servers are, read and write times, memory utilization. That's all data, right? <clears throat> Human resources, you know, how are we doing in the way of uh, marketing positions, getting people in the door for interviews? Who are we hiring? Accounting, financial information. Is more money going out the door than is coming in? You know, sales, how's that new product doing? Um, are the marketing efforts that we're putting forth producing the number of sales, the number of turnovers? Are they producing the number of prospects? Are we turning prospects into leads? Are leads then becoming customers? Are they making that purchase? So that's marketing, sales, kind of together, production, you know. How many parts did we produce? What is our failure rate? How is quality of our production? So a lot of information now that we have through all these systems that um, that is disseminated and used successfully to run a company. Now, of course, the other side of that is information overload. And if you have an email address, you understand information overload. You know, unless you are with a company that has a great spam filter, you're getting a bunch of stuff disseminating down to you that you have to search through and go through and, you know, figure out. Every morning I open my COCC email, there's probably 10 to 15, you know, potential spam emails coming through there. So uh, top managers, yeah, they use more information for strategic planning. It's the long term data. How did we do last year? How did we do two years ago? How did we do last month? Um, they use that data to forecast where the company is going to go based on trends. You know, we might look at, um, you know, what the gross domestic product numbers are and how that compares to our product if we're in that GDP. You know, competitive threats, who's opening businesses like ours, who are our competitors, is there new federal regulation coming down, how might that impact our data? You know, a great example of that would be HIPAA, right? Um, HIPAA and the health organiz and the uh, health industry. So, middle managers, you know, direction, supervisor, team leads. What kind of overtime do we have? How much overtime are we expected to have based on our production schedule? You know, uh, should we be able to produce everything in regular hours, or are we going to need to work Saturday to get that order out? And if so, how does that impact the profitability of said order? Supervisors, team leads, you know, daily operation, you know, again, um, you know, might might be time cards, time sheets, uh, parts coming in. When are the parts coming in? Who do I need to schedule to do installs or do service calls based on orders that we have, back orders, stuff like that. And then operational employees, yeah, transaction processing systems, you know, a lot. So when we think of operational employees. <clears throat> just think of a fast food restaurant and the people that work in there, they're going to be told or, or the system might even tell them at the end of the day how much they produced, how quickly they produced it. You know, um, it might even go as far as if people are getting online and filling out those surveys. Um, that information comes back to them. Well, you know, I serviced uh, 15 service calls today and my quality rate was four and a half out of five stars today, you know. Uh, maybe I have a bad day and it's three and a half today. Something's going on in my life. You know, but all of this information is valuable. So when we start looking at development, well, we start with modeling. We want to 
model the business. What is it the business does? You know, what is it they require to do? What's data look like? Object modeling. You know, how do we utilize object-based programming uh, to instantiate an object, program it once, and instantiate it multiple times for use within a system? We might have to look at the network model. Of course, the network model has changed. That used to be strictly a local area network model with access inside our network via a desktop or maybe even a crazy old laptop. But today, the network model will include information that's disseminated out through the web that's available both publicly and privately through the web. Um, it may mean disseminating information out to a dashboard that's a web-based dashboard that automatically changes format if I'm on my phone, if I'm on my tablet, if I'm on my laptop, if I'm on my desktop. Um, and then the process model. So, you know, what is that process? Now, we tend to start with a thing like a workflow process. How are we doing this now so that we can understand how we can automate it and perhaps make the process better? So. Prototyping, you know, earlier working versions of information systems. We're talking information systems, but of course we know what a prototype looks like with a car. And it's a similar thing. You know, we can start prototyping user interfaces. Is this what you're telling us you need? No, we want to move this over here because this text box plays with this text box. And once I put in this information, I have this and I want to put it in next. Okay, we can start prototyping and move that around. We also call that storyboarding. OK, so we start creating storyboards, graphical representations of a user interface of a system. Then the bottom end, how is it processing? What's going on in the black box? These are all things we're going to discuss in detail throughout this class. All this process can speed up development process significantly, but of course, prototyping can take time. Today, though, we can do pseudo coding that can become actual production code within our system, so something to keep in mind. Uh, important decisions, you know, might be made too easily before business or IT issues are thoroughly understood. We have to be careful here. It's such, it's become such a focus to do rapid application development, agile development. Let's get our product out to market yesterday that we can miss serious issues. And you know, a great example of that is the auto industry. They're producing so many models so quickly. And then what do we hear about two, three months after? A major recall that's costing them millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars um, in fixing things that they should have caught had they have taken time in the prototype. But the challenge is we as consumers, we want the latest, we want the greatest, and we want it yesterday. And this holds true um, in application development as well. So. There are some tools and ways that we can increase development. We can now go 24 seven on development where we're not just developing it locally, but when we're done with our work day, we ship it off to a country whose work day is just starting. They might do some additional coding or they might be testing the code that we wrote in the morning. Finally, it goes out to you know another country where they're finalizing the product or making improvements or beginning to work on the next section of code. So we can literally be developing 24-7, 365. So computer-aided systems engineering or case tools, we'll talk about those. They are a graphical representation of the system. We like graphical representations. That's why we create charts and graphs to represent a bunch of data. It just becomes easier to understand, especially for the end user who may not have the technical acumen that you as the systems analyst have. So structured analysis. Traditional method for developing systems. When we develop systems that help us develop products, services, etc., we can utilize those systems over and over again. And that's what structured analysis, object oriented analysis, agile or adaptive methods. You know, we continue to improve on the tools we're using to build products and services. And and as we know, this is both in our physical world, you know, building better cars, building better televisions, building better computers, all the way down to building better software. So structured analysis is time tested, you know, uses phases called systems development life cycle or SDLC. OK, it's a predictive approach in the fact that we start looking at what might happen 
today, tomorrow, and into the future. Uses process models to describe the systems uh, graphically. So here's a great example utilizing a tool called Visual Analyst, you know, where we have um, a data store called students and a data store called courses, and those are going to populate into a process called register students. So this data is going to come in. It's going to be able to give us some sort of user interface where students are going to register. They're going to go through a process, a business process, and finally register for classes. And then we would populate from this data information in the classes. Now, as we talk about this being a database, we're then going to come back and reference or link to the courses and link to students in creating these class rosters so that we're not um, creating redundancy within our system where we're holding data multiple times for use in multiple places in the system. That can become tragic, especially if we talk about it from a basic standpoint where maybe I have an Excel spreadsheet that has customer information, I share it with someone else, mine gets updated, theirs doesn't, and for example, we ship a $75,000 aviation unit that is a warranty replacement to an old address where the customer no longer lives, it's dropped off, someone signs for it, and they get away with a $70,000 avionics system. We now have to ship out another one because the data wasn't updated. So there's a great life example of that. So the SDLC includes systems planning, analysis, design, implementation, security, and support. Now we're going to spend most of our time in the software development lifecycle supporting and perhaps increasing security. Planning, the more time we spend plan, that's a great four-letter word. Plan, plan, plan. The more we plan, the better we can analyze. We'll go back and forth. We'll reiterate back and forth through the planning and analysis phase. We'll start working into design. That's where the system starts getting designed. And then finally, once we have our data dictionary and our storyboards and everything, We'll implement it into a physical software security system. We'll start testing. And then we're at the point where we just are maintaining or improving an existing system. So I'll let you read through these. You know, what, what is systems planning? You know, it's a systems request. You know, it begins with an idea. Okay. Or, hey, can we improve this in a system? It may be that we go through the SDLC, the software development lifecycle, on an existing system, not just systems that we're replacing, not just systems that we're improving by utilizing the latest technology that's available to us. So just some things for you to consider there. You know, key part of preliminary investigation is a feasibility study. Remember that um, you know when when Steve Jobs had the idea of a personal music player that could fit in your pocket, the technology didn't exist that day to create that product, okay? So sometimes some of our ideas are literally not feasible because we don't have the technology uh, to manufacture it, for example. So, you know, look at, look at processors. Look at how small processors are going. We didn't have that technology to manufacture processors of that size 10 years ago. Analysis, we start building a logical model of the new system. So, you know, what it might look like on paper, right? Perform fact-finding techniques, building business models, process models, object models. How is all of this stuff going to come together to produce a system that's going to be both profitable, have a return on investment in most cases? Now, there are times that we take on development of systems where it's not something that benefits the company, but it is... Um, prompted by, say, federal regulation or state federal regulations um, or local things that we need to meet the needs of in order to continue our business. So, you know, deliverable is a systems requirements document. This is what we can use. It is our plan for the system. So when we finish this document, we're going to know who, what, where, when, how, and why every aspect and element of the system will be constructed. Now, sometimes when we do this process, we'll do a phased implementation. 
And what that means is we'll be looking at what we'd like to do with the system six months from now, six years from now, maybe. But today we're going to meet just the most immediate need, that need that if we can solve this problem for the company, can produce better profits, can produce more efficiency, can increase quality, can increase the number of customers coming in the door and asking about our products, for examples. So systems design, well, it starts where we create that physical model that satisfies all the documented requirements. This is where we go out to the programmers and say, now take our plan and implement it. So this is where we finalize or design that user interface. Now we already have plans of what that user interface should look like, what the screen should look like, how they're going to interact with the database. Is there middleware that needs to happen? Is the data going to be disseminated out to within the system? Or do we need to produce a website where data is, is prompted and data is stored and data is uploaded? We need to identify outputs, inputs, and processes. You know, what are the outputs? Now, we've already done this, but how are we going to output the data? Just look at reports today. It used to be you wanted a report. You went to someone in the company who knew how to get into the database and write the report, and they'd give you a printout. And that data was only as good as the printout. An hour from now, that data was invalid. Today, we create reports that you just single click, generate this report for me at the end of the day, compare it to yesterday, compare it to last month, compare it to this time last year or over the last five years so we can get more data if it's available to us. And then, of course, this deliverable is the system design specification. So we know exactly what the system is going to do, how it's going to do it, when it's going to do it, and where. So management and user involvement is critical. End user involvement, management involvement, it's critical throughout this entire system's development life cycle. Management knows what they need. They know how much they're willing to spend to get it. We know that the end users are the specialists. They're the ones that know how to do this. They knew how to do it before the system was developed, and they might be the best ones to know what the system needs to do to improve their productivity, to give them better reports, to make their job easier, to make their job faster, whatever the case may be. So implementation, that's when the new system is constructed. That's when we do the testing. Um, that's when we do data conversion, if we're converting from an old system so that we can bring all that old data in so that we're not running two systems that we're reporting from and trying to disseminate the two together. And then, of course, support and security. Now, when we talk about security, we start talking about security from the get-go today. This is no longer a second thought process. This is a first thought, especially as we're allowing people to consume this data that may be proprietary to our company through a web-based interface, through their personal phones that they use for business. So object-oriented analysis combines data and processes that act on the data. So here's the idea we have this object called a person. And then we can create child objects that have more attributes from the person. And this tends to parallel how we would think about constructing a database, right? So we would never have a database with a table of customer information and order information. Those would be two different tables. So we can start disseminating out objects in the same way in that this person object can be imported into an instructor object, common attributes shared, additional properties and attributes added as we process the data. Some methods to do that. I'm going to want you to spend a little time referring to or researching what agile methods are. So I'm not really going to go through this. I want you to spend some time. You can pause this. And matter of fact, let me go back here. You can pause this and read through this. You know, the Agile method, Microsoft has their own method, Sun Microsystems has their own method, Apple has their own method. They all say their method is the best way to design, deliver, and support software. So remember, it can just depend on the business and the culture as well. So Agile, they're focused on the end result. They're focused on getting there quickly. They're focused on utilizing multiple teams, working consecutively on different aspects, 
to deliver the product with high quality as quick as we can. Do some research on joint application development and rapid application development. I'll have you be um, blogging on that as well. So development methods, well, you know, a plan. You're going to see this word a lot. Develop a project plan, of course. Involve users. Listen carefully. A lot of times we know what we think we want. We know what we think the user wants. We shut down our ability to listen. And consequently, the user doesn't get what they want. The company doesn't get what they want. There is one key question that should be asked on a daily basis as we go through this project. And it's a very courageous question to ask. Because if you're the systems analyst and you've been working on a project for three months and you see it's going left, you're just not sure we need to continue the project. We don't have the resources. We don't have the finances. We've run into challenges, whatever the case may be. That question to ask each day is, is today the day the project needs to stop? Is today the day I need to have the courage to go out and tell management, whoa, this project has to stop today. Here's why. Here's what we might do to get it on track. Or maybe we're just unable to produce what the plan had indicated. We use tools, though, to keep us on track. And we'll talk about a lot of these tools. Project management tools, identify tasks and milestones. We'll talk about PERT, uh, WAC, CPM charts. We'll talk about Gantt charts. We'll develop some of those. At the end of the day, we really need, and this is a really challenging thing, is to develop an accurate cost on what the system's going to cost. Now, not just what it's going to cost. Remember that as we start a project, we're incurring costs. So we're utilizing people who... Um, are paid an hourly or a salary wage. They're no longer doing their job. They're sitting in an office. We're talking about the project. We're talking about requirements. That's cost to the project. A lot of times companies will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to research and develop a plan for a project and then say, okay, nope, that's not going to produce the return on investment we thought. We're going to shelve it for now. Maybe technology or something changes in our business that requires us to move forward at a later date. We always want to remain flexible. However, with flexibility comes change and we need to manage change because in the development cycle and in the implementation cycle, we don't want to find out that, oh, well, we'd like this feature now or we'd like this to change or that to change. We may have already spent the investment on programming our system. So the IT department, you know, this is kind of an interesting slide to look at. This would be, you know, a medium to large size company's IT department. They're going to have dedicated application development staff, um, system support and security staff, user support, end user support, database administration, network administration, web support. Quality assurance is a huge part of IT today. You may find out that you work for a company where you are the application developer or you're the project manager and you're outsourcing application development. You're outsourcing database administration. You're outsourcing network and security information. So the idea of an IT analyst has has changed. Um, you know, the, the job is forever evolving around the technology that's used to implement new systems. So. Application development, you know, team consisting of users, managers, IT staff, anyone who is either going to use or be affected by the system needs to be included. And if you noticed in that initial slide about who's consuming the most information, you know, it's those bottom level employees. And if they're consuming the most information, they're probably putting in the most information and the system needs to work for them first. So. You know, certification, just like with all of our industry, you know, uh, project management certifications are available. Certifications mean to an employer that you have been certified by an industry standard and that you are an expert or, you know, maybe not an expert, but you have a core knowledge 
that they can rely on you for essentially. So whether that's an A plus certification, a network plus, or simply a Microsoft Office specialist certification. You know, if you're using Microsoft Office and an employer is looking to you to be the key, those specializations or certifications can help. So user support, definitely important. Database administration, network administration, web support. Go ahead and pause these, read these. Don't really need to go through the whole thing. So what's the role of an analyst? Well, the role of an analyst is everything. Um, if you're a project manager, that's a little bit different than an analyst. Both terms kind of used in conjunction with each other. A project manager may just be managing the project, may not have the technical skills to understand what the programmer is doing, what the database administrator is doing, what the database programmer is doing, uh, what the web developer or user interface developer is doing. Where an analyst that's someone who can talk all that tech across these different um, job positions to successfully produce the product that the company, that the end users are looking for. So, you know, an effective analyst will involve users in every step of the development process. Yes, because it's a great way to say, is this what you were telling me? Is this what you need? Will this work for you if we develop it in this way? Communication skills are important. Technical knowledge is huge. Business skills. Folks, for you IT staff, if you've got extra classes you need to take towards your degree, go go take some business classes. Get an introduction to business because that's what you're going to be working for. You're going to be working for or inside companies that are there to make a profit first and foremost. And how is it that your job can decrease, reven uh, can decrease expenses, increase revenue, increase quality, bring in more customers. How is your job and this product that you're developing going to do this? So critical thinking skills. Today when we want the answers, we go out and we Google it. But what you're going to find is in these systems, there are no answers out on Google. There may be companies who produce a product that may meet your needs, but we needed to start with defining what those needs were. How are we going to meet those needs internally? Is this a competitive advantage is the way we put a wheel on a car, a competitive advantage. And that's why everybody's having us put wheels on cars. Who knows? Education, certification, recertification, staying on top of those tools that are available to us today. Huge career opportunities. We're seeing large growth in IT. Uh, we're seeing salaries up uh, from 2014 to 2015 an average of 12% increase in salaries, um, tons of jobs out there to be had for people who have the skills, have the certifications, have the education, and most importantly, have the experience. So I'm going to give you an opportunity in this class to get some experience with building or reviewing an IT system for a company as we review a case study throughout this term. So there we are. You know, job titles, company size, it all plays into it. Here's the summary if you want to go through it. I'll just hold right here. I'll hold right here. We've talked about all these things. Hold right there. And we're done. All right, so have a great week. And I look forward to hearing from you all on how the class is going. Take care.